take your Bibles and be turning with me to 2 Kings chapter 3. I was going to change the sermon to deal with the topic Adam brought up out in the foyer, but I figured we'll let that rest for now. So. That's he. Uh, uh, we're going we're to stick with this. Yeah, dig it. Uh, I failed the sermon title back in the day, so we're just going to skip that title. It was a bad. That, that was a bad pun. This is what happens when you know, the, the sermon titles aren't, aren't great. But Second Kings chapter three. So we want to look at uh, Jacob. Go ahead and put that on the slide. that says context. Somehow those got out of order. Uh, but. Uh, well, as we look at this, we're, we're in 2 Kings chapter 3. Last week we were in uh, 1, so we're passing on through the, the, the ministry of... We passed on, 2 Kings 2 passes the ministry of prophecy in, in Israel from Elijah to Elisha. And it's in chapter 2 that Elijah catches the fiery chariot, goes on into eternity, and then Elisha comes back and he parts the Jordan River uh, and that, that whole situation. But here we are in chapter 3. Of course, we have the, the kings of, of Israel are still bad. And the kings of Judah are not great. And we introduced a couple of weeks ago as this was developing that there was a rebellion that the Moabites rebelled against the house of, of Omri, um, against Ahab's descendants, and in chapter 3, that's still going on, and I didn't give you a picture of the Misha Stilly this week, because I figured you'd probably be tired of that, but that, that rebellion has happened, and so this is where we are. Joram is king over Israel, Jehoshaphat is king over Judah, and I mean, that's just a great name. I really wish that somebody else would name their kids Jehoshaphat, there's no way I'm naming my kids that. Um, but some of y'all should really think about that. Some of, you grand, some of you, as you hope to one day be grandparents or whatever, you should be starting to build that up in your kids that, that, they, that you'd like a grandchild named Jehoshaphat. Um, I don't know why you would want that, uh, but they would learn to spell, probably, or they would be very angry, one of the two. But this is where this, this context is. So, so Joram and Jehoshaphat are together. And they're talking about the rebellion of the Moabites. And Joram says, will you go to battle with me? And Joshua says, sure. Now, something to keep in mind before we go any farther with this. When the wicked king says, would you go do this with me? The answer should not be, sure, why not? The answer should be, no. So much more of our lives as followers of Jesus would actually go smoother if we would just grasp a very simple principle off of the overall context that you get in 2 Kings several times, where when the wicked king says, let's go do this, and the righteous king says, yeah, I guess we can. If we would learn that the answer to that question is, no, let's not. So often, though, we start trying to calculate that. And we start, try to start trying to figure out, well, but if we go with the wicked king, there's this benefit or there's that benefit. Well, maybe I can influence the wicked king towards the right. Maybe I can. The answer is no. Maybe we can compromise a little as a church with the world around us when the world says, do you don't have to stand firm on this truth in Scripture. You can soften on that one as long as you hold to this one. And, and when the world says, well, just, just make this change, and that's, the answer is no. Because in the end, the wicked king is going to try to get what he wants, and bad things are going to happen. In the same way that if you came to my house for lunch, and you said, well, you know, what, what, what are we going to drink over lunch? I said, well, I've got some sweet tea in the fridge, and we only put a couple of drops of strychnine in it. <laughs> you would pass. I mean, we're on Central Arkansas water, so there's no telling what's actually in the tap water, but, you know, y'all down here in East End, you actually get, you know, your water's a little different than ours. Uh, but you, you would pass because how many drops of poison does it take? One. It's bad for you. Okay? So, but that, that's your overall context. That's what's going on. Oh. <coughs> Misha, the king of Moab, has rebelled. And so they go and they, 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 they call the king of Edom. They send a message to him. Edom has also been conquered by 
Israel, they're under their, their domain, they're under their, their, their submissive there. And so he tells the Edomites, you have to come and fight with us too. So Joram and Jehoshaphat, the king of Edom, and they're on their way out uh, to go and to establish their rule over the Moabites and to remind that. Now, if, if you don't know this part about the geography of that part of the world, let's just make sure we understand something very, very important. There's not a lot of water out there. There's not good, easy places to stop and get food and beverage, especially 2,800 years ago. Okay, They have not put in a McDonald's yet. They haven't put in anything. And so you can get out there into the wilderness as you go around the Dead Sea, the water of which you cannot drink, because it's bad. You get out there into the wilderness as you try to loop up and come up onto the territory of the Moabites, and you can get your whole army wiped out real quick without ever fighting a single battle, because the weather will destroy you. You think it's been hot here, and you say, oh, it's a dry heat out there in the desert. It's 110 degrees with sunlight beating down on you and no water to drink. It's not a healthy place to hang out. And so they've been out there in the, in the weather for a little while, and things are not going well. They have no water for them, for their animals. All right? So that's where we are. So we'll pick up in verse 10. Uh, so let's, let's go back to the Bible verses there, Jacob. But, uh, in verse 10, then the king of Israel said, Oh no, the Lord has summoned these three kings only to hand them over to Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Isn't there a prophet of the Lord here? Let's inquire of the Lord through him. One of the servants of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, who used to pour water on Elijah's hands, is here. Now, first of all, let's pick up the slight error under the king of Israel said, Oh no, the Lord has summoned these three kings only to hand them over to Moab. Nowhere in the text does it say the Lord summoned these three kings. At no point until here had they even mentioned seeking God's will and God's direction. This is another thing that we tend to do. I don't understand why God didn't help me out of this situation. Did you ask the Lord before you got into that situation whether you should go there? No. So what makes you think that the Lord has put you there and left you there to die when you got into a mess that you didn't ask Him about in the first place? Joshua affirmed, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Joshua and the king of Edom went to him. However, Elisha said to King Joram of Israel, what do we have in common? Go to the prophets of your father and your mother. No love lost there. The king of Israel replied, no, because it is the Lord who has summoned these three kings to hand them over to Moab. Elisha responded, by the life of the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, and the Lord Almighty, depending on what translation you've got, before whom I stand, if I did not have respect for King Jehoshaphat of Judah, I would look at you. I would not take notice of you. Elisha looks the king of Israel dead in the face and says, You know, if it weren't for these, this guy, who actually does worship the Lord our God, I would leave you out here to die. But because I respect him, and the Lord has said, I'll, I'll look at you, I'll talk to you. Now, bring me a musician. While the musician played, the Lord's hand came on Elisha. Then he said, this is what the Lord says, dig ditch after ditch in this wadi. For the Lord says, you will not see wind or rain, but the wadi will be filled with water, and you will drink, you and your cattle and your animals. This is easy in the Lord's sight. Water in the desert is easy in the Lord's sight. Keep that in mind. He will also hand Moab over to you. Then you will attack every fortified city and every choice city. You will cut down every good tree and stop up every spring. You will ruin every good piece of land with stones. Now, visit that neck of the woods these days, there's not a lot of trees and there's a whole lot of rocks. Guess what? Still have to, it's still that way. About the time for the grain offering the next morning, water suddenly came from the direction of Edom and filled the land. So we'll stop there for a minute and let's, let's look at what's going on here. So let's hit the one that says overview, please, sir. So what's going on here? Well, it's fairly straightforward. They're in a mess and they're about to die. They say, well, we need a prophet. Let's actually, let's finally stop and ask God for help. 
we ever do that? We get ourselves into our own mess. And once we're finally in a mess and we're all the way up against the, oh no, what do we do now? It's like the old bumper sticker that, that you used to see a lot that had the picture of the Bible and then it said, when all else fails, read the instructions. You ever stop and think about how offensive that is to God? Wait for everything else to go wrong and then ask his opinion? When all else fails, read the instructions? How about before you get into the mess? Read the instructions. Here, before everybody gets salmonella, know what temperature you're supposed to put raw chicken to. You know, pay attention. Read the warnings. Even if you have to look, if the warnings come after the instructions, make sure you get there and read the warnings. Read the instructions. Consult with the Lord first. But instead, what they've done is they've got themselves in a mess, and now it's, well, let's call on the Lord. We have this habit. We do this, too. Oh, well, things aren't working, right? Let's pray. Before you start working, pray. Like the other old chestnut, as long as there are tests, there will be prayer in schools. Let me tell you something. As long as there are students who will call out, call out to Jesus, there ought to be prayer in schools, whether they take tests or not. Now, sometimes those, te those tests lead to those prayers like, oh, Lord, help. Lord, you designed chemistry. I don't get it, but surely you do, so help me out here. And then there's those annoying prayers that you get from professors in seminaries and Christian colleges that is, Lord, help these students recall all that they have studied. It's like, that's not what I needed. <laughs> they find that they call out to the Lord, of course, they, they well, let's, Jehoshaphat says, let's make sure we get a real prophet here. And we see in some other instances throughout First and Second Kings that the, that the kings of Israel had their own false prophets that they would call on, and those they would come in, oh, yes, everything's going to be great. And then they finally get somebody who says, well, let's ask the prophet of Yahweh, of, the Lord, of, the, of our God, of Israel's God. See what he has to say. I don't really want to talk to him. He usually has bad things to say. So one of the servants of the king of Israel points out, Elisha is there. I love the description of him. He used to pour hands on the water of Elijah. He was Elijah's servant. He helped Elijah out. He was around him. Oh, well, the word of the Lord is with him. Let's find out what he has to say. Elisha initially, the first thing he hits is that stand for truth. Look, why are you asking me? You don't even worship. You don't even worship the same God I do. Why would you ask Yahweh what he wants done when you don't trust him with anything else? Then he gives us some instructions. He says, okay, well, let's do this. Bring me a musician. And this, this is your biblical justification. This is why the army has a band. You know, you always got to have a musician <laughs> available. Now, I don't know what it looked like to haul a piano through the desert like that. I'm pretty sure it wasn't good for it. But, uh, but, but you get the musician, and they come, and there's worship, and they, they call out to, he calls out to God, and the Lord sends his word and gives him some instructions. And says, tell them to do this. Tell them to dig ditches, make a whole wadi. A wadi is a dry riverbed. Okay, it's a seasonal river that when it is the season, there's water. And when it's not the season, there's not. And the season is about two weeks in the spring and maybe a couple weeks in the fall. This is how you get, when you read scripture and it talks about the spring rains and the fall rains or the early rains and the latter rains, that's what it's talking about. Is That's where the water comes from. Naturally in the Middle East in that particular part of the region. It's not like Egypt where it all comes out of the river. The river floods, you get water, and the river goes down. Israel, Moab, Eden, Edom, Jordan, uh, Judah, all of that region, it's the rain comes, it rains for a little while, then the rain goes, and it doesn't rain for a long, long time. So they're in this dry riverbed. It's not the time for it to, to, to rain. It's not the time for it to be watered. But the Lord sends his word to Elisha and says, Dig ditches, I will fill this place with water. You won't hear where it comes from. You won't know where it came from. You don't know where it went. But you'll have more than enough water. And so they set the army to work to dig it. And sure enough, the next day, water fills the land. And they're able to drink. They're able to, to live. The animals are able to live, or steal. You, you take animals with you because you don't have refrigerator trucks. Okay? You do understand that that's the cattle that they have brought with them. Is That's lunch. That's next week's lunch. 
So, you know, if the cows are going, hey, look, we've got water, yay, oops. Just like those sheep <coughs> survived the year on the ark. And then bad things happen. And so they drink. But then on top of that, what happens next in the passage is that the Moabites look and they see the water, they see the sunlight reflecting off the water, and they say, oh, that looks like blood. The valley is filled with blood. They've gotten mad at each other. You've got three kings here. They don't get along. And they've crossed swords and their armies have killed each other off. Sounds like a you know, sounds like a movie plot. So this is what really happened, because 2 Kings is written well before you're making movie plots. And so the Moabites come in thinking that they'll come into the plunder, and there's the armies of everybody ready for them, and they wipe them out, and the Israelites go on to, to reassert their dominance over most of Moab until the Moabites resort, resort to child sacrifice to call upon their gods and everybody gets really angry and it just doesn't go well and then everybody goes home. But what do we see here? What, what matters to us? Well, as we look at this, let's see if I can get this thing to click for the next one. There we go. Why does this matter? We see that even in the midst of a mess of their own making, for the king of Israel and the king of Judah and the king of Edom, even in a mess of their own making, God gave instructions through his word, because when the prophet speaks, the prophet speaks the word of God. Okay? Now we have a tremendous blessing in that we don't have to dredge up a prophet to get the word of God. You just need one of these. And if you don't have one, we have stacks of them. You can have one. Okay? Uh, through the Word of God, He gave instructions about what to do. So, so what do we do about it? What do we do with it? Well, we, we borrow some of the things that we see here. There's three things that we see happen here that matter. We see that there is worship. The whole, bring me a musician. That's worship through music. That's what's going on. Okay? I'm not going to pick up the guitar and chase you out of the building. But... There's worship, and from worship they come to the word of the Lord, and from the word of the Lord they find the work that they're supposed to do. So you get those three W's that go together. You have worship, through worship they encounter the word of the Lord, and from the word of the Lord they find the work that they're supposed to do. So what do we do with that? Well, first of all, we ought to worship. What is it to worship? Well, sometimes it's music, sometimes it's reading scripture, it's prayer, but we ought to worship. Elisha goes and he wants to spend time in the presence of God so that he can bring the word of the Lord. If we're not worshiping as individuals and as a church, we will miss what God is trying to say to us through the word of the Lord. Why does he need a musician? Why does he do that? Why is there a moment where that happens? Well, you think about this. You think your life is hectic and chaotic. You think that there's a mess going on in your life because, well, there was this, and there's traffic, and then there's having to find a job, and then there's this going on. I had to cook, cook dinner, and, I, you know, and I'm thinking about what's in the crock pot, and you know, I'm hoping that the preacher wraps it up in time because we set the oven to cook, and you know, I, last week I ate turtle briquette roast, and I really don't want to eat it burnt again. And, and, and then there's this, and then this coming week we've got this, and we've got that. There's all these things going on. You think you've got chaos. Imagine yourself surrounded by an army that's about to die of thirst. Elisha's got plenty of chaos too. And by the way, he's out there in the wilderness with them. It's not like he just rode in. He's been out there wandering in the wilderness too. He's dry. He's thirsty. All of the chaos around him says, what I've got to do before I try to tell you what God has to say is I've got to stop and worship. Our lives ought to be marked by, before we get into anything else, we take the time to stop and to worship. As God's people, as individuals, as a church, we take the time to stop and to worship. Now, before we can worship, we've got to get one, other, one thing straight, though, and that's the argument, or not even the argument, just the straight statement Elisha gives to Joram, king of Israel. Why am I even talking to you? Go worship your false gods. See what they tell you have to make sure that we are on the Lord's side, that we are worshiping the one true God rightly and fully. And the only way to do that is to be in a relationship with Jesus, who is the one who died for our sins. And to have accepted the grace of God. 
for our salvation. If we haven't done that first, then our worship is just empty. Our worship is like the worship of the king of Israel. It's to the, all sorts of other things, but it's to nothing that's real. And nothing that can answer our questions, nothing that can fill our needs, that can meet what we have to have to survive. And certainly nothing that is eternal and helpful and hopeful. Make sure that worship is pointed in the right direction to the one true God. But it's not enough to just worship. Sometimes we think that that's all we need. I just need to go to church and need to go get my worship on. Now, most of y'all don't talk like that, but I know some people that do. And we just, you know, we go crank up the music and that's all we really need. If we could just, you know, if we could just go to church and have just a couple of hours of really good music, never mind the argument that this row is going to have with that row about what defines really good music, okay? Some of, some of us, you know, our opinion is very different on that than others. And it's because we let the music and what we define as worship be the only thing we're interested in. When it's really just the opening stage. See, the worship is not the be all and end all. It is from the worship that we hear, that we understand, that we grow in the word of the Lord. Sometimes that's through the same things that we actually sing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names. If that truth hasn't quite penetrated in your heart yet, it needs to. Tell me the story of Jesus. To remember, tell how he left his home in glory. Be reminded that the Lord is holy. Be reminded that it is him. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Sometimes our, our the word the worship and the music is is where that's where the word reflects in the first place, <clears throat> and then it says we study it whether it says we study it in a Sunday school class or a small group or as we look at it together as, as a church family we look at the word together. That's why we include things like readings of the word in our in our service. But the word then comes. If we don't worship for the purpose of understanding and internalizing and taking in the word of God, then we're worshiping for no good reason. All we're, at, all we're chasing after there is either an emotional satisfaction or to check a box off. We went to church. Boop. But you know what happens when you just do things to check a box off? Well, we went to church. Check. We had practice. Check. Do we actually internalize what we were supposed to do? No, but we checked off that we showed up. <clears throat> Nothing changes. When the test comes, we don't have anything ready for it. The worship leads to the Word. When we look to the Word, where we listen to the Word, where we pay attention to what the Word of the Lord has to say about our lives and about what we ought to do. And in this case, the Word of the Lord gave them work to do, and it was this, grab a shovel and start digging. And I honestly thought about picking up a you know, hundred little tiny shovels to pass out in church this morning. Um, but the only ones I could find were at a restaurant supply store and they were labeled as being there for ice cream shovels. And that was what was on every pack package. It said ice cream shovel. And I knew if I passed those out in church today, half y'all would be asking, where's the ice cream? The other half of y'all would be asking, where's the other ice cream? And so I don't want to be responsible for that much ice cream. Because it'd get melty and get down in the carpet and that would be a problem. But he says, make this whole valley full of ditches. Dig. Of all the instructions that you could figure that they were looking for, dig shallow ditches all around the wadi was not going to be one of them. Some of them possibly expected, no, dig, dig a well right here. As deep as you can, and eventually you'll hit water. Now, the geography of the Middle East, you'd have had to dig really, really deep to actually hit water in that neck of the woods. Others were probably hoping that the word of the Lord would come and say, yes, pack it in and go home. Others maybe even were hoping that the word of the Lord would be, go ahead and wipe out, you know, there's enough water if you wipe out all of the king of Edom's people. Instead, the instructions were instructions that seemed a little nonsensical. 
Dig shallow ditches. There's work to be done that we're instructed to do by the word of the Lord. And we're not instructed to understand exactly why God has told us to do it. We're instructed to follow it. And that work, in turn, lets them see the deliverance of God, first of all, for themselves. It's the satisfaction and the, the meeting of their needs. The water that God provides, which then ought to echo in our hearts. If you've read the Bible a few times, you ought to think about John chapter 4, where Jesus talks about being the living water. And how we've never thirsted again. So it starts with meeting their needs to survive, but then it even goes on and digging ditches leads to the victory in battle that, that they wanted as a people. It leads to, to success, it leads to what they what they desperately were after. Which in turn, for those who understood that it was the blessing of the Lord, fed back into their worship. And then the more that they would have worshipped the more they would have understood the word of the Lord, the more they would have undertaken the work of the Lord. You see, it's a cycle. But it's not a tragic cycle. It's not a sad thing. It's not one of those, oh, we're just trapped in this and we're never going to get out of it like a traffic circle. Been 30 minutes trying to get off of Fair Park Boulevard the other day. Just, just kidding. Y'all, there's a reason I'm scared to drive in Conway. They got those circles everywhere in that city. And around and around. I got a friend, he's a pastor in Conway, and he loves them. I'm, like, I'm glad the Lord called you to that church. You're in the right place for it. I like stop signs. It's not, it's not a loop like that that you just don't know how you get started or how you get off or how you get out of it. It's thin. It's, it's a loop that starts and that it builds us and draws us closer and closer to Jesus as we do it. That we worship, so we understand the word, so we see the work God has for us. And then we, what do we do? We do it again. As we see, as God blesses and, and provides through the work that he's given us, we have more cause to worship and it's easier for us to worship. And so then we're able to dig farther into the word and it just goes on and on. And that becomes what the life of the people of God should look like. Every Sunday when we gather, every Wednesday when we gather, all the other times that, that the different groups in the church meet, when the men meet for breakfast, when the ladies meet for whatever they do, the senior adults, all of those things when they happen, we ought to gather together and have it look like that we're here to worship, to look to the Word, and do the work that God has given us. So next Sunday when we get together, it ought to be that we celebrate what God has blessed and the work that He gave us to do that we've done. And that celebration becomes our worship. And that worship drives us to the Word and then drives us as we go out to do more of the work. And then we come back the next week and the same thing. And it grows and it builds and it builds. Because what God has called us to is not to go out and wipe out the Moabites as much as we may not like Moabites. But instead it's to go to the people around us however wicked they may be. And the Moabites were really bad, by the way. I mean, they were bad, bad. Like, mm. they wouldn't even get on HBO. Okay, that's how bad the Moabites were. But it's to go to people like that and carry the message of the gospel that the Lord of hosts is there and that they, can, that they have two choices, to surrender and change their lives and let Him make them alive in, in, his, in his grace and in His mercy, or eventually to face the judgment that God will execute in all ways. And as we see lives changed, that ought to drive us to worship. Look at the graciousness of God. Look what it means when we say that great is His faithfulness, not only to us, but to all things, and to what He has said, and what He will do. Look at His faithfulness in the work that He's done in our lives and in other lives. It will be worship, draw near through the Word, go out to the work that God has done, has called us to do. That those three things would resound every day in our lives. Lord, let me worship you this morning.
draw near to you through your word and to go out to the work that you have for me. As we settle in for the evening when the day is done, to stop and reflect and worship over the work that God has had us to do in that day and to take comfort in his work as we settle in for the night. And let that become the rhythm of our days, the rhythm of our weeks, the rhythm of our life. To worship, to look to the work, and to do the work which God has called us to do. It's what we're made for. Fearfully and wonderfully created for. We wonder sometimes why we don't fit. It's because we're doing outside of what we are created to be and to do. We're living as if I had gone out yesterday instead of taking the feet pushy thing with a little blade on the bottom to cut the grass down in the lawnmower. If instead I'd have gone out there with a pair of scissors and thought, well, I'm going to mow the yard if I cut that with and sewing scissors. Those of you who sew know that I would be dead had I done that. Yeah. And we would have wondered why that was so frustrating, though. Because we were doing things that we weren't made to do and using things not in the way that they're intended. God gave you your life that you would worship, look to the Word, and work for Him, for His glory. Let that drive you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your Word. We thank you that you accept us in worship. We pray, Lord God, that you will help us. Father, to follow you will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to our time of invitation. I'm going to sing the hymn, I Surrender All, which is a great one for this point. And remember, all is a pretty inclusive word. We're not about to stand together and sing, I surrender all except for this. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit in the song, and it doesn't fit as an offering to the Lord Almighty. It may be that you need to come and ask for prayer for something. You may need to come and talk about what does God's Word say about needing a Savior. There may be other things on your heart that you need to come and pray for or come and ask for. But whatever we can do, we can stand together and sing. Randy's going to lead us as we sing. That's where we're all standing in front of that talk. We'll pray next.